Hi, good evening, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. I am Aaron Cohen. I'm the co-founder of Therma. And today you're going to be hearing from Monik Suri, the CEO of, of Therma, about what we've been working on as a company and, and more importantly, the industry and ecosystem that we now find ourselves in at Therma. Um, this has been a, a quite a journey for us, uh, particularly over the last year. Uh, the pandemic has dramatically changed the cold chain industry. And this we've been working on this, this presentation, this talk um, for uh, a few months uh, in, in terms of conception and research, primarily to, to try and help to engender and catalyze conversation about how important the cold chain is in the context of the broader uh, climate movement and how we get to a safer and more sustainable planet uh, and do that in a way that's really good for companies uh, and our customers. So um, a couple of, of key points. One, there's going to be uh, ample time for Q&A at the end of Bonnick's presentation. Certainly want to encourage conversation. So please jot your questions down. You can chat them to us in the chat and we will take them uh, one at a time as we as we uh, go at the end. And then the other thing is I really want to uh, thank people who are here today and have been patient with us. We had previously scheduled this um, a month ago. And then Monik, uh, you know, has some news that he's going to share with you that I think was a complete legit legitimate reason to postpone this presentation. Um, so with that, um, it's been a, a great month in the, in the Thoma family, but as you will soon see, um, you know, it's a complicated month in the world. So, Monik, I will turn it over to you to talk about the state of the cold chain in 2021. Uh, thanks so much, Aaron, for the, the kind introduction and for, uh, you know, making the time to, to, to bring us all together. Um, it's really a pleasure to see so many friends and familiar faces. And for those of you who we, I've not had the pleasure to meet, I'm looking forward to starting a relationship. And thank you so much for the time uh, today. Uh, I have to say this is a particularly emotional day. Uh, my first child, my daughter, was born a month ago today, so it's her first month birthday today. And um, as Aaron uh, alluded to, it's been an exceptionally rewarding month for me at a personal level. I've just enjoyed the joys of becoming a father, of experiencing the miracle of life. Um, as I've been saying to my friends and family, it, it does live up to the hype. <laughs> and um, it's been really wonderful to experience uh, the kind of innocence of youth and to see uh, what it's like to see the world through a child's eyes, uh, though it's only been a few weeks. I, I feel like I'm getting a window into the next many years. Um, and at the same time, uh, as, as positive and as, as rewarding as these small moments in our home have been, as I kind of think about and, and, and read the news and hear what's going on across the planet and around the country, um, I have to say it's, it's a very uh, emotionally uh, challenging and in some ways anxiety inducing time. I think about the world that my daughter Arya is going to grow up in. Um, we're living amidst uh, unprecedented events. Uh, today, there's reports about uh, reservoirs reaching uh, record lows. Last week, there were reports of floods in Western Europe. Um, there are wildfires raging in Western United States and Oregon. There are all kinds of um, climactic conditions that are changing in ways that are troubling and uh, that we can't ignore, can't avoid. And on top of that, there is a resurgence in the COVID-19 pandemic. There's concerns about the Delta variant and about new variants that are emerging and what, what that might mean for our recovery as a, as a community around the world. And so I think um, this topic uh, that we're gonna talk about today, and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to the discussion after a short presentation is, is more topical than ever. And, um, and the cold chain uh, is really at the heart of both uh, the COVID response and the climate crisis that we're living amongst. So uh, again, with, um, with much thanks and, uh, and, and, and very much a kind of forward looking stance, I'm gonna share my screen and walk through a presentation, but I'm, I'm so uh, thankful for you guys uh, for taking the time to join us today. So let me get started here and we'll jump in. This is my 92-year-old grandmother, Kanta, and that's me. Uh, Kanta 
is a retired physician who lives in New Delhi. And this is a screen grab soon after she got her COVID vaccine. Um, that's me uh, soon after I'd gotten mine. And what you'll, you know, what I appreciate and what many of you will appreciate is we're amongst the fortunate uh, who were able to get vaccinated early and who have had the privilege of being able to access these life saving and life giving uh, compounds. Um, so many around the planet have not as yet. And I think that's part of the reason why we're talking about the cold chain. The cold chain as an infrastructure layer is vital to human health. It's at the heart of uh, food, it's at the heart of pharmaceuticals, and yet most people, including myself, had never heard of it and have never heard of it until recently. And I think that that is uh, one of the amazing things about the cold chain. This is one of the most significant infrastructure layers that we live in, and yet we're not able to define it. And most people don't know that it's right under and around us. So let's talk about the cold chain and not just its impact on human health, but also how central the cold chain is to the planet's health. And, and that's really the tension that we face today. Well, the cold chain, as we think about it, is a network of temperature controlled supply chains. These are essentially integrated segments that move products that are perishable from production all the way to consumption, to our plates and into our bodies. The cold chain is ubiquitous, it's everywhere. It covers a range of industries, uh, from the fruits and vegetables that we love to the dairy products that some of us love a little too much, myself included, uh, a bit of a cheese fan over here. Of course, the pharmaceuticals and the vaccines uh, that we're so focused on that are making headlines over the past year and a half, uh, as well as uh, products like flowers and chemicals, and even data, uh, such a you know important uh, layer of the modern economy, in some ways the lifeblood of the modern economy, uh, data relies on the cold chain in the form of refrigerated server uh, centers and, and server farms that are essentially large refrigerated boxes that maintain the cloud and computing power. All of these are really part of and held by the cold chain. We think of the cold chain as three unique segments. On one end, you've got storage. And for those of you who've not been in a cold storage facility, and I certainly hadn't until a year ago, now I've been to a half dozen, imagine a Costco, a Costco sized facility. Now imagine five of those stitched together into a giant refrigerated space that's kept at sub-zero conditions. That's a cold storage warehouse. There are many of these, thousands of these, and tens of thousands of distribution centers around the world. Those store product right when it's made and before it gets moved downstream. From there, there's a segment that we think of as transportation. This is the transit layer, the trucks, the trains, the ships that are refrigerated and move product all over the world. In some cases, thousands and even tens of thousands of miles. And the transit layer is really important and, and, and especially significant layer for certain products such as vaccines. The final segment is what we think of as retail cold chain. These are the hotels and hospitals the restaurants and retailers that provide perishables that we consume and, and frankly, that we interact with every single day of our lives. In total, these three segments are what we think of as the cold chain. There are many different industries and many different cold chains across those industries. Today, we're gonna to focus on the two most important, food and pharma. Right now, in 2021, food is the cold chain industry's most important market. And that's for a number of reasons. Over the past couple of decades, the frozen food industry has, has, has burgeoned as consumer preferences have shifted in rapidly developing economies and in developed economies. And as they've seen a massive growth in food retail, moving from small informal marketplaces to more uh, formalized retail segments, big box retailers, convenience stores, and supermarkets. That's happening globally. We've also seen a huge growth over the past 15 years in online shopping in the past few years in e-commerce related to food in the form of meal delivery and as well as um, grocery delivery. And so we've got a huge growth going on, especially over the past 18 months in online shopping on the food cold chain. There's also related to these drivers, two other significant external pressures. One is a growing focus on reducing food waste, which we're gonna spend some time talking about but food waste is one of the biggest single problems in the supply chain. It's a huge source of waste and loss. And as more and more companies and more and more 
governments have focused on reducing food waste, that's put pressure on improving the cold chain to maintain perishables. And in the last decade, we've seen regulation come out in especially certain developed economies, the European Union and the US and Canada, to improve food safety and quality. That regulatory change has also put pressure to improve the cold chain. In total, all of these drivers have made the food cold chain a massive infrastructure layer. Of course, you know we can't ignore the pharmaceutical cold chain. The uh, news every single day talks about the importance of vaccine delivery and, and the challenges around vaccine access and vaccine efficacy. Uh, we all know that some of the most important vaccine compounds today are highly temp sensitive. This has been covered for much of the past year. Well, what not often talked about is just how broken and how limited the cold chain is. The Associated Press reported about six months ago that 3 billion people will be without access to a COVID-19 vaccine over the next couple of years because of inadequate or unavailable cold chain. That's a massive swath of humanity. That's just a huge uh, percentage of the global population that won't have access to life-giving vaccines because of inadequate cold chain. And so the cold chain is more important than ever for human health. We're seeing a massive growth as a result, and people are recognizing on the investor base, capital market side, as well as on the operator side, that there's a need to invest in building more uh, cold storage, transit, and retail facilities. And so we're seeing massive growth, tripling in the cold chain across uh, these segments globally over the next few years. Today, the food cold chain is about five times larger than the pharmaceutical cold chain. And of course, these numbers are, are shifting. Uh, food right now is largely consolidated. So the food industry, if we think about it as a kind of global market, the average pallet value is relatively low. Food is fairly inexpensive on a poundage basis. And so what you end up having is food moving across many locations and ending up primarily in retail establishments, the cafeterias, the amusement parks, the local cafe, and all of the supermarkets and convenience stores. And so the, the vast majority of the value in the food cold chain sits in the retail segment downstream. In pharmaceuticals, pharmaceuticals are actually quite expensive and the pallet values are pretty high. And so what you have is a, is a highly upstream consolidated cold chain where most of the value sits in the storage and transit segments. That's where the product is usually sitting right after production before it ends up getting to the pharmacies, the hospitals, and the clinics uh, that we need to get access to these compounds. Pharmaceuticals, and especially a specific type of compound called biologics uh, that, are, that are synthesized or built off of organic matters, are growing rapidly. And these are highly expensive and very temperature sensitive products. And because of the biologics growth, the pharmaceutical cold chain is going to be rapidly growing over the next five to 10 years. This is one of the major drivers of the cold chain in terms of the value of product that's moving through. As biologics emerge, and many companies are working on the R&D layer today to put more biologics into the world around new disease burdens that have never been able to be treated. But we're going to see more and more focus on cold chain. All of this advancement in the cold chain, all this growth has been terrific and will continue to be terrific for human health. But what's incredible and what's often not thought about is the environmental side, the planetary health that is being affected by this cold chain. And that's really the next section we're gonna talk about what is going on as the cold chain gets colder to our planet. Well, it turns out that the cold chain is one of the single biggest drivers of emissions. Around 10% of global emissions come off of the cold chain. That's a massive number. That's not a number that I was familiar with. It's not a number that most people I've spoken with had ever thought about. The cold chain is just a huge aggregator of emissions for a number of reasons three major drivers of warming across the cold chain. The first is energy. Around 4% of emissions globally comes from the energy and the electricity specifically that's used for cooling. That's a huge single variable. Another 4% comes from waste of food products. That's a huge number as well. When we talk about that in, in, in aggregate, we're talking about roughly a third of all food that gets produced being thrown out every year. And then refrigerants are another driver and significant on a single basis, on a standalone basis. Refrigerants are the chemicals that go into refrigeration to maintain the cooling effect. These are essential for refrigeration, but they're actually extremely harmful for warming because they have a massive global warming potential. They heat up the atmosphere significantly and they get emitted when refrigeration goes down and when it dies. Let's just talk about each of these for a moment in turn. Well, 10% of global electricity is being consumed for refrigeration today. That's just a 
staggering number. That's one of the single largest sources of consumption for electricity, which makes sense when you think about the fact that refrigeration is everywhere in every economy and largely available to most people in most markets. And so because it's everywhere and because it's ongoing, we have a huge amount of electricity powering that. Getting products to retail and storage units is also extremely emitted. About a quarter of fall petroleum that's consumed is consumed by the vehicles that transport coal product. When you think about that, that's again, just a hard to ignore number. A quarter of fall petroleum consumed is going to coal transit. And that's partly because products move really far. When we wanna have berries out of season and melons you know, in the middle of uh, you know, uh, our, our, our afternoon meal and, and off season hours, that's because we're moving that product often a thousand plus miles. And that's the, the average distance that food travels to get to our plates. Comes at a cost. Refrigerants are also, and as we've talked about, a major emittive variable. When you think about the global warming potential of CO2, it sounds important, it sounds significant, and it is because there's a lot of CO2 being put into the atmosphere. But refrigerants can be up to 11,000 times more warming than CO2. So on a molecular basis, they're ultra warming or super warming molecules. And because they get emitted when refrigeration goes down and when it dies, these refrigerants are getting put into our atmosphere uh, at, at dangerous rates and, and at massively warming rates. And so we have this tension. On the one hand, the cold chain is critical for human health in the delivery of food, pharmaceuticals, data, and other life-giving basic goods of the modern economy. On the other hand, the growth in the cold chain, and there's going to be a lot of growth in the cold chain, is massively detrimental to the planet's health. This is an issue of life and death. Today, the WHO estimates that a quarter of vaccines get degraded due to shipping issues. And we talked about transit being important for vaccines. A quarter of vaccines are being spoiled during transit because of issues around the cold chain. Pre-COVID, there are estimates that around one and a half million vaccine preventable deaths were occurring each year. Who knows what that number is going to look like after 2021 when you think about the kind of vaccine related deaths that might be and might have been prevented if there were more vaccine available to more of the global population. So huge, huge human toll for getting the cold chain right. It's also about feast or famine. Around a third of all the food that's made every single year is wasted. A third. That's just a very hard to kind of fathom number. But, you know, this is an annual recurring statistic. And in developing economies where the cold chain is often weakest, 90% of the cold chain, 90% of the spoilage happens because of supply chain issues, largely related to storage and handling. And so most of the waste in the developing economies that happens is preventable and is related to cold chain and cold supply chain problems. And that's really one of the areas where the cold chain needs to and will focus. What does this look like in, in kind of human terms? Well, if you think about the amount of waste around food that goes on every year, it would take a landmass twice the size of all of Australia to create that much food each year. And that much food, when you think about the emissions related, is more than the entire Indian economy generates every single year, one of the most uh, emittive and one of the largest global economies today. So it's just a huge amount of waste with a staggering uh, impact for the planet and for the economy. The amount of dollars that are thrown out is also kind of just mind blowing. Close to half a trillion dollars of food gets thrown out every year because of supply chain issues, just kind of staggering. And still in 2021, over 800 million people are chronically undernourished around the world. So the cold chain continues to be important for many different players on the human level, the economic level, and the planetary level. What's really concerning, if you're, if you're getting you know, concerned, if these numbers worry you, uh, what, what's really concerning is that the cold chain is already a major source of emissions, and it's growing massively over the decades ahead. And so that's really what we need to talk about. How do we address the growing cold chain? Well, today, just to give you a sense for the scope of the potential for the global cold chain, less than 10% of temp sensitive perishable foods are placed in cold chain systems, less than 10%. That means a huge portion of global food is not yet in cold chain systems, which just gives you a sense for how much growth is coming. If you take cold storage for a moment, 
Just think about the density of cold storage warehouses available to the global population. In America, we have around two and a half people having access to a cubic meter of cold storage. And in Europe, around five people per cubic meter. Today, in two of the largest and fastest growing economies in the world, in China and India, those numbers look more like 12 people per cubic meter in China and 18 per cubic meter in India. So the cold storage ecosystem is way under penetrated in these kinds of economies. And so we're gonna see a lot of growth in cold storage warehousing to kind of catch those numbers up. This should give you a feel for just how underinvested the cold chain still is. Let's look at transit for a moment. France is an economy, it's a country that has 66 million people and 140,000 refrigerated vehicles moving its highways and streets. China has around 20 times the number of people of France, 1.3 billion, and only has 66,000 refrigerated vehicles today. India is even less populated in terms of the, the penetration of cold chain. And that's just indicative of the kind of explosive growth we're gonna see in cold chain assets. And we're seeing this. The cold transit economy is growing at 15% CAGR in China and India because of the kind of underinvestment today in the cold storage and cold transit segment. So we're gonna see huge explosive growth in these economies as they start catching up to those kind of densities. But because of that explosive growth, we really see that the cold chain is at a crossroads. The question we face is, are we gonna to continue to build infrastructure and expand the global cold chain in the same way we've done using conventional and legacy tools and technologies, or are we gonna do something different? Well, in this last section, I wanna suggest that there is an opportunity today to build a new 21st century smart cold chain. And that's really what we wanna focus on on a go forward. The smart cold chain has to substantially minimize its environmental impact by reducing waste and controlling emissions that come off of the energy, the food and perishables, and the refrigerants that are consumed in providing refrigeration end to end. One of the building blocks of a smart cold chain is temperature monitoring. And that's something we've spent a lot of time at Therma focused on. The startup that I founded and run based in the Bay Area, Therma, builds smart monitoring solutions to help reduce loss and waste. If you think about some of the preventable waste, it's staring us in the face. I mean, these are examples from the US over the last six months of vaccine doses. They could have gone into people's arms, but instead got thrown away. Especially early on when we were facing huge shortages, these were extremely preventable. And just speak to the kind of basic nature, but the necessary essential nature of temp monitoring. But monitoring isn't enough. There are many environments, for example, cold storage warehouses like this one, where monitoring is actually not the problem. These folks are not under cooling, they're over cooling. So having cooling work consistently is not, consistently is not just enough. You also need to maintain automated and precise temperatures. Over cooling is a huge energy suck. It also ends up degrading and destroying product. And what many of the 3PL, the third party logistics players struggle with is how to maintain adequate precise cooling instead of just over cooling their environment. So it's really about getting temperature management down. That's one of the key building blocks of a smart cold chain. In addition to temperature management, there are an ecosystem of innovations that are emerging around a smart cold chain. There's real time tracking and monitoring of assets as they move. There's inventory and warehouse management that can help reduce waste and inefficiency inside distribution centers and warehouses. Taken together, the combination of real-time monitoring, optimization, and ultimately visibility can help reduce energy costs, food waste, and deliver quality products to the consumer. A few of the key technologies that are being leveraged today, I'm just gonna spend a couple of minutes on these. First and, and, and foremost is kind of the, the building block layer, which is cloud-based applications and real-time tracking. These enable, these technologies have been around for years, but unfortunately the cold chain as a legacy infra infrastructure layer just has not adopted them until recently. We're seeing a renewed interest in these kind of technologies that were essentially ignored by the cold storage, cold transit and, and refrigeration industry in favor of manual human-driven processes. We're finally seeing these kinds of technologies emerge and be deployed. Building on top of cloud and real-time tracking is a, a, a new focus and in many ways, uh, a renaissance of industrial IoT. A combination of sensors, 
uh, real-time monitoring on top of those sensors, and then artificial intelligence, the ability to actually take that data and analyze and optimize settings, whether to eliminate undercooling or overcooling, is emerging. There are a number of technology players, both startups and established players, that are leveraging industrial IoT and the data technologies built on top of that to start creating efficiency. We're also seeing companies, small and large, starting to put robotics to work to reduce warehouse energy consumption, warehouse labor, and ultimately the cost and the injuries associated. These are going to make efficiency gains on both the storage and ultimately on the retail segments. And robotics are emerging as a new class of innovation across the cold chain segments. And finally, we'd have to talk about electrification of the fleets. The vehicles that transit, that move products from A to B, are one of the biggest single sources of consumption of petroleum and also of electricity um, across the board. What we need to start doing is electrifying those fleets and moving from a carbon-based uh, to a decarbonized model. And we're seeing that creates ROI, both for the operators and ultimately for the planet. These are ways of creating efficiency for the logistics players and reducing the carbon footprint of their fleets. In total, these innovations stitched together are just the beginnings of what a smart coal chain could look like. But it's clear that we need a cleaner cooling model if we want to minimize climate change. There's no way what we've done in the past can work with the kind of explosive growth we expect. This photograph is a picture of uh, New Delhi, uh, where I was born and where uh, much of my extended family lives. My grandparents uh, live in New Delhi. And this is an, uh, an image that, that really is close to my heart because I go back every year uh, to visit. And as uh, some of you might know, New Delhi has amongst the worst air pollution now in the world. And so days like this are unfortunately all too common, much more common than they were when I was a kid going back to visit. And um, this just kind of speaks to some of the you know, human costs of, 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 of climate change, the kind of lived experience that we have as we kind of imagine the future that we're gonna inherit and that our children and children's children will inherit. But this is not just about developing economies. Climate change impacts us all. This is not an image of New Delhi. This is an image of my hometown, San Francisco, taken last year, about a year ago. And this is indicative of some of the what's on people's minds today. We live in the midst of wildfire season. We're living amidst some of the worst challenges around climactic events here in the Bay Area and all over the developed world as well. Climate change is a global problem that impacts all of us. And so I think in conclusion, I wanna say that building a smart coal chain is really the only viable path we have from a cooling standpoint, if we wanna both advance human health and the planet's health. Thanks so much for joining. It's been a pleasure to be here this afternoon and I'm very much looking forward to engaging all of you. We'd love to get connected. If, if we're not already connected, please check out our website, hellotherma.com. Feel free to reach out to me directly monic at hellotherma.com. Follow us on social and would love to talk if we're not already connected. Thanks so much. Aaron, over to you. Well, Monic, that was, um, that was terrific. And, uh, and I, uh, I, I really want to encourage people to, you know, just go ahead and, and, and type questions into the chat. I, I, I want to kick us off, though, Monik. I wonder if you could um, give people a sense of, of what it's like out there in the world when you talk to non-cold chain people. I, I, I mean, you and I have had this really unusual experience um, in that you know, we, wherever we go, we sort of are starting to tell this story and this is maybe the most structured telling of it. Um, what, what, what's the response been like as you've kind of cruised around? Yeah, I think it's, it's illuminating, Aaron. I, I think even our experience is illuminating in many ways. Um, I, you know, I thought I had understood a lot of the, the core uh, economic functions and the kind of structure of the economy. Uh, pretty well. I thought, you know, I had a background in political science and political economy, had worked in private equity, worked in government. Um, and I have to be honest, I had never given the cold chain any thought. I had never, it never occurred to me that the cold chain as a, as a sector uh, was as important or as significant as it was. I think I took it for granted. Uh, refrigeration has been around for 165 years. 
uh, came out of the United Kingdom in the 19th century was uh, gradually uh, you know, spread uh, in the Industrial Revolution and, and afterward in the industrializing early 20th century. And it's been ubiquitous for much of our lives. And so I think most people just think, oh, it's refrigeration, like how interesting and how relevant could that be? And as we started to go deeper into the refrigeration ecosystem and discovered um, some of the major uh, sources of uh, inefficiency, the kind of energy that's being consumed every single day on cooling, the kind of uh, waste every single year, the fact that a third of all food made gets wasted, much of that in the supply chain, um, and the fact that we have uh, refrigerants, uh, single biggest variable on a, on a standalone basis that could reduce um, global emissions, global emissions across all variables, that that touches on and is a fundamental um, ingredient in refrigeration was new to me. And I think when I talk to friends uh, in different parts of the world, whether it's investors or uh, entrepreneurs or policymakers, it's pretty new and pretty um, underappreciated for, for most folks. And, and I think that's really part of our goal uh, is to spread the word and let people know about the cold chain so they can think more about um, ways to, 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 to improve it, both to advance human health and to protect our planet. So Mata, you know, starting to get some questions specifically, how do you, you know, what do you think the biggest challenge to updating the cold chain uh, at, in order to kind of stanch emissions, right? How do we, how do we actually make an impact swiftly uh, or even over time? Yeah, I think that's a, it's a, it's spot on. I think there are many different solutions in many different um, um, areas for innovation. Some of them are technical. Some of them are business model. Some of them are regulatory and legal. I think the challenges to upgrading the cold chain to reduce its environmental impact are manifold. There are many challenges. One of the most significant challenges is historically, there hasn't been much incentive to do so. Uh, it was fairly cheap to spill refrigerants or to leak refrigerants into the planet and the atmosphere. Refrigerants are a fairly cheap class of chemicals. So uh, without some um, externality and some incentive, to actually uh, reduce your refrigerant leakage rates. Uh, we tolerate in the US until a recent regulation came out, 30 to 35% refrigerant leak annually per piece of equipment, according to the latest EPA guidelines. That's a lot of refrigerants that we allow to leak. And these are in the US and, and these are uh, actually under enforced. Uh, the Washington Post had a investigative piece that came out at the start of the year that looked at actual refrigerant leak rates and showed they were closer to like 50, 55%. Um, not 30%, that's tolerated by law. So there's a huge challenge around incentives. There's also, I think, a huge challenge around infrastructure uh, upgrades. The legacy nature of much of the cold chain makes it really hard to overhaul. So much of what we're talking about is not just retrofitting, but building anew. Uh, the median age of a cold storage warehouse, is, according to C.B. Richard Ellis, which did a study last summer, is 41 years. You know, that's the median age, which means there are warehouses that were built in World War II that still have cork siding. Well, for those of you who don't know much about building materials, cork is not an especially good insulation material for refrigeration. Turns out it's pretty porous. Um, so when you have cork siding in the walls of refrigerated warehouses, you can imagine the kind of energy inefficiency we're facing. Trying to upgrade those kind of um, warehouses is challenging, and the kind of capital expenditure needed is not insignificant. And then I think there's a question of um, you know, innovation from a technical standpoint. Can we really get the best and brightest to focus on this issue? Many of my friends uh, work in technology as entrepreneurs, as investors, uh, and, and as, as operators. I think there's a lot of um, uh, talent in the tech ecosystem today, more than maybe there's ever been. There's also a lot of capital, as many people have been writing about. Not that much of that talent or that capital is focused on upgrading the cold chain today. I can tell you that my delivery of uh, you know, the latest food that we got last week, which was really helpful when we weren't able to, to make food at home and we're kind of running on fumes with a three week old in the house, our food delivery is working really well and super optimized. Uh, our ability to kind of buffer and, and manage on certain apps uh, like Netflix is exceptional and I'm a huge consumer. So I'm thankful for that. 
The content is terrific. We have a lot of talent working on other areas of, of the uh, economy, but how many people are working on the smart cold chain? I can think of a handful around the world, and I've talked to a lot of entrepreneurs. It's kind of considered an unsexy problem. And that's really, again, part of what the goal of this conversation and conversations like it are about, to try and get people who have a lot of talent and capital to think about the kinds of problems that might matter. You know, Monica, I just want to continue the conversation around this idea because I, I do think, you know, you and I have experienced that there is a great deal of enthusiasm, particularly around young people, uh, people in their 20s and 30s, to work on climate related problems. Um, on the other hand, most of the people we interview have never heard that the cold chain is a problem. And so, you know, to some, to some degree, how do you want to, uh, how do you, you know, how do you see us? Uh, engendering, you know, how, how, I mean, I'd be curious to hear, you know, how you think about getting the word out there on this, on this particular challenge. I mean, we've been, again, stunned at how few people know this story. It's, it's true, Aaron, and, and I can't overstate how underappreciated the cold chain is. Um, it's really kind of, and I, and I think, you know, we can speak from firsthand experience. We were, you know, fairly um, under uh, invested in and unaware of how big the cold chain was as a sector. I think that's one of the first things. People don't appreciate the scale of the cold chain. The fact there are a couple of hundred million refrigeration units in the world, not including domestic refrigeration, not including home fridges and freezers. There are so many of these assets out there. I do think that uh, part of the you know, public and part of the consumer consciousness around the cold chain has shifted in the past year. And really that started to shift last summer in the summer of 2020, when people began talking about vaccines. Uh, we saw a number of news reports, uh, 60 Minutes did a special on the cold chain. Uh, a number of front page articles came out. The Atlantic had a piece on the cold chain. Uh, and, and I think people started to uh, at least become aware that in order to get access to life-saving vaccines, this, uh, this, in, this infrastructure layer, this kind of refrigeration layer, it has to work. Um, what I think is still um, you know, uh, an open question and, and really hard to gauge is how do we connect the climate community and the kinds of folks that want to focus on climate into the cold chain ecosystem? There are so many climate investors I've talked to uh, and climate tech entrepreneurs I've talked to that still have never heard of the cold chain. And I think that's starting to change. And you know, part of what we're going to do is try and change that by continuing to tell the story. Um, and we're seeing people come out telling stories around cooling talk more about clean cooling and, and some of the public consciousness. But uh, even in the climate tech Here, ecosystem, it's fairly new. A couple of other questions for you, Monik. Just coming back to the presentation, you talked about a half a trillion dollar industry that the cold chain is becoming. Can you just kind of talk about what the revenue components of that are? To be specific around, you, you showed some pharmaceutical, the size of the pharmaceutical cold chain, the size of the um, food cold chain. What is that revenue comprised of? Yeah, so the you know we think of the the kind of revenue as the dollar spend that businesses place on moving and storing, and then again moving and storing product. So it's essentially the logistics spend on moving assets, storing assets, and then bringing them to the endpoint. It's not the actual inventory value of that product, which is considerably higher. It's the amount of spend going on across all different businesses that are both initially moving, then storing, then moving, then storing that product. It's how much they spend on logistics and getting that product from A to B to C, and then eventually to our plates and into our bodies. Yeah, and can you, can you, you know, specifically, you have this interesting slide about how, um, you know, there's kind of three components to the emissions problem that the cold chain presents. Um, and and I, I'm just curious, how does Therma interact with those, those different things, right? You talked about emissions, food waste, and energy usage. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the three drivers, the three major drivers of emissions in the cold chain are energy spend, uh, the product wasted, and the refrigerants emitted. Today, the platform that we're building at Therma touches on all three of those. Most directly, we at Therma have built an IoT-enabled smart monitoring platform. 
a series of sensors and software on top of those sensors that can help catch downtime early and often, first and foremost, to reduce waste and spoilage. So the direct and most immediate impact of Therma is to help businesses and companies uh, ranging from McDonald's and Taco Bell and Burger King to Marriott and Wyndham and Hilton are using Therma, uh, as well as uh, folks in other industries, uh, places like 7-Eleven in the convenience market, and then uh, up the uh, supply chain, UNFI in the distribution market, and then also in the cold storage warehousing industry. We're doing some proof of concepts today with market leaders. The spoilage prevention is a direct impact of real-time monitoring, but then building on top of that, we've also started working on management. Management is not just about monitoring, it's about optimizing. And there we're using the data layer to help drive recommendations, to help suggest whether settings or uh, operating conditions could be run more efficiently, more effectively. That might mean something seemingly prosaic. For example, we had a convenience store chain, uh, a national brand, one of the top three players in, in, in their market um, that was using uh, manual processes for checking temperatures. When they put Therma into uh, a couple of dozen locations, they discovered that every night of uh, every uh, Friday night uh, on a weekly basis, when they had inventory delivery coming, people were leaving the doors of the walk-in freezers open for a couple hours, burning shelf life and burning um, inventory. So they were burning the actual shelf life and ultimately the energy spend associated with that by just leaving the doors open while putting inventory in and moving inventory out. We were able to see that in the data, make a recommendation that led to an operating change where they're now being a lot more efficient about that delivery. That has ways of reducing food waste and reducing energy waste. Simple, prosaic example but there are close to a million restaurants in the US alone. So when you think about the kind of scale of these seemingly small, but you know, considerable inefficiencies, they start to really stack up. In the warehousing side, for instance, Therma is being used to help businesses catch overcooling and also uh, find hotspots. And the goal is to start reducing the energy consumption by reducing the need to overcool, by lowering the, the overcooling. That requires knowing where the heat distributes in the warehousing space and being able to under or, or lower the thermostat in certain areas, raise the thermostat in other areas. And that's not possible without real-time distributed monitoring. And so there we're trying to reduce and, energy. And, and just to be clear for everyone, Monik, you're telling, how do they currently measure the temperature in warehouses and convenience stores? I mean, I, I don't, I, you know, for those of us in the technology space, the idea of measuring temperature seems like a fairly simple concept. Is it not? Is it not? Yeah, it, it, it does sound like it ought to be really simple. And from a consumer perspective, uh, many of these challenges do seem trivial. Uh, turns out uh, that when you go to the industrial environment, many of these workflows are not easy to solve. I was at a warehouse and, and members of our team spent time in a warehouse owned and operated by one of the largest, one of the top two players in pharmaceutical and in global logistics uh, that stores and moves vaccines. And they have, they have people, they have line staff walking around with a clipboard multiple times a day, ostensibly taking the temperature. That's how they're monitoring. That's in Southern California. That's not, you know, um, th th that's in a fairly, um, you know, advanced portion of the global economy. And that's one of the top two players in the world. There is a lot of manual process still going on. The a vast majority of food service, restaurant, convenience store refrigeration is manually monitored or not monitored at all, depending on, on, on your business and your perspective on manual checks. Part of that is technical, Aaron. It's been really hard historically to build sensors that work inside refrigeration. The refrigerated box actually acts like a Faraday cage it blocks signal from getting out. And so Wi-Fi and Bluetooth based systems haven't been able to penetrate uh, historically. And so we've had a lot of challenges in the past getting real-time monitoring in the cold chain. Therma is using novel technology that leverages a combination of radio frequency and then software developed uh, for analyzing and optimizing on top of that to catch loss events and to reliably monitor these kinds of environments in a way that wasn't possible before. That's why we're getting uh, market traction today. So, you know, we're, we've got time for one more question. I think it, it kind of speaks to some of, not just your presentation, but some of your, your personal interests. Uh, Monica, you, you talked at length about the developing world's lack of cold chain. You talked at length about 
the supply chain challenges just with food in the developing world. Um, we got a question here that says they would love to hear you talk about the cold chain's intersection with 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 movements for equity and racial justice, right? And I, I just wonder if you could speak about that, not just domestically, but internationally. It's a, I, I, I so appreciate that question. I think it's um, very much at the gestalt uh, of our time and, and something I've given thought to as someone who's uh, both lived in uh, multiple countries, including uh, a, a part of my childhood in India and grew up largely in the US and spent time working in international affairs early in my career. Um, there's a book that just came out um, that I'm reading right now called After Cooling uh, by Eric Dean Wilson. Uh, the New York Times had a review of this last week. And um, uh, Eric writes about uh, some of these themes in the context of cooling from the standpoint of air conditioning, another major source of emissions closely related to refrigeration. Um, refrigeration has historically been a privilege. Access to the cold chain has not been equitable. It has not been available to all. Even today, in 2021, as the Associated Press reported about seven months ago, there are huge swaths of the planet that don't have access to cold chain reliably. Uh, and, and, and that's where that 3 billion people not having access to a COVID-19 uh, vaccine due to cold chain issues came from. Cold chain issues, not just economic buying power, but inadequate supply chain. I think what we have seen historically is like many modern technologies, uh, the development of the cold chain has followed the development of first the colonial powers and then the, uh, the former uh, decolonizing and ultimately industrializing economies that are now developing. Uh, it started in Europe and in North America and then became more available as other economies grew and became richer and more successful. Even within countries, it's not equitable. And so the distribution of cold chain is going to be more um, clustered around the wealthier, uh, better situated uh, portions of any given country. And so building a better cold chain, a more effective cold chain, a more accessible cold chain is very much about enhancing and advancing equity. And then when you take the climate implications of the cold chain, it really it's, it, it doubles the equitable or the kind of inequities of the cold chain today, the potential for equity in a future cold chain. As many people have written about, the climate challenges that we face and climate change as a whole is going to have massively unequal effects and is having massively unequal effects on the planet. Poorer developing economies are more affected and poorer developing communities are more affected today by climate change than wealthier ones that can often insulate themselves and have infrastructure available that are often less, um, that are more resilient. And so to the extent that a cooler cold chain makes for a warmer planet, uh, there's a real tension if we don't create a smart cold chain because that's gonna hurt uh, the poorest and the most vulnerable even more than it is uh, those of us who are privileged. Uh, and so I think the cold chain has multiple connections to both social, um, uh, international and, and, and racial equity, both directly and indirectly. You know, so we're coming up uh, at the end of our time here. Uh, I, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, Monica and I spend a, a, quite a bit of time thinking about how to create a global dialogue um, about the problems Thermo is working on, not because it, not simply because it'll be great for Thermo, although clearly we will benefit, um, but because it's been our experience that there's just an incredible lack of awareness. Um, so we will um, uh, be distributing this presentation. Uh, you know, there'll be a link to it, and 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 hope you'll you'll find time to share it with people that you think would benefit from seeing it. We're really just super interested in engendering dialogue. Um, thank you all for being here very much, Monica. I want to turn it back to you uh, to have the last word this evening before we let everybody go. Really, I, I, I can't say enough how, um, how much I've enjoyed uh, getting to know many of you. I feel I have so many friends on this uh, webinar today, and hopefully those of you who listen in uh, in the future, if we aren't already connected, uh, please do reach out. I think these kinds of problems, um, as with any uh, life work, are really personal at the end of the day. Um, I come from a family of doctors, as many of my friends know, uh, my parents and three of my grandparents, my wife, my brother, all physicians. A lot of time I've spent 
um, around people in healthcare, the cold chain became extremely central and extremely salient to our family over the past year and a half as many people worked in the healthcare setting. I think for those of you who've been hopefully um, fortunate enough and, and, and prescient enough to get vaccinated have kind of experienced some of the, the advantages the cold chain offers, but really for everyone who cares about the future of the planet for, for, for yourselves. Uh, and I have to say as a new father, it's never been more on my mind than it has been this past month. Uh, the kind of world that Arya is going to grow up in, the kinds of things that she might get to experience or not get to experience if we don't um, work on the climate crisis and alleviate the climate crisis imminently is, um, is almost too uh, disturbing to, to, to fathom. And so I really ask all of you to engage with us as we think about the smart cold chain. Please reach out if you'd like to continue the conversation. We'll be doing more of these over the next year. And I look forward to getting to speak with many of you in the months and weeks ahead. Stay safe, uh, stay well, and uh, speak soon. Sam, thank you so much for putting this together. Sarah, it's a pleasure. Glad to have been here. Thanks for teaching me. I'll talk to you guys soon. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye. Have a good night.